Chapter 21 Joseph and His Brothers This chapter is based on Genesis 41, verses 54 to 56, chapter 42 to 50. At the very opening of the fruitful years began the preparation for the approaching famine. Under the direction of Joseph, immense storehouses were erected in all the principal places throughout the land of Egypt, and ample arrangements were made for preserving the surplus of the expected harvest. The same policy was continued during the seven years of plenty, until the amount of grain laid in store was beyond computation. And now the seven years of Darth began to come, according to Joseph's prediction. And the Darth was in all the lands, but in all the land of Egypt there was bread. And when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. And Pharaoh said unto all the Egyptians, Go unto Joseph, what he saith to you, do. And the famine was over all the face of the earth. And Joseph opened all the storehouses, and sold unto the Egyptians. The famine extended to the land of Canaan, and was severely felt in that part of the country where Jacob dwelt. Hearing of the abundant provisions made by the king of Egypt, ten of Jacob's sons journeyed thither to purchase grain. On their arrival they were directed to the king's deputy, and with other applicants they came to present themselves before the ruler of the land. And they bowed down themselves before him with their faces to the earth. Joseph knew his brethren, but they knew not him. His Hebrew name had been exchanged for the one bestowed upon him by the king, and there was little resemblance between the prime minister of Egypt and the stripling whom they had sold to the Ishmaelites. As Joseph saw his brothers stooping and making obeisance, his dreams came to his mind, and the scenes of the past rose vividly before him. His keen eye, surveying the group, discovered that Benjamin was not among them. Had he also fallen a victim to the treacherous cruelty of those savage men? He determined to learn the truth. Ye are spies, he said sternly. To see the nakedness of the land ye are come. They answered, Nay, my lord, but to buy food are thy servants come. We are all one man's sons. We are true men. Thy servants are no spies. He wished to learn if they possessed the same haughty spirit as when he was with them, and also to draw from them some information in regard to their home. Yet he well knew how deceptive their statements might be. He repeated the charge, and they replied, Thy servants are twelve brethren, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. And behold, the youngest is this day with our father, and one is not. Professing to doubt the truthfulness of their story, and to still look upon them as spies, the governor declared that he would prove them, by requiring them to remain in Egypt till one of their number should go and bring their youngest brother down. If they would not consent to this, they were to be treated as spies. But to such an arrangement the sons of Jacob could not agree, since the time required for carrying it out would cause their families to suffer for food, and who among them would undertake the journey alone, leaving his brothers in prison? How could he meet his father under such circumstances? It appeared probable that they were to be put to death, or to be made slaves. And if Benjamin were brought, it might be only to share their fate. They decided to remain and suffer together, rather than bring additional sorrow upon their father by the loss of his only remaining son. They were accordingly cast into prison, where they remained three days. During the years since Joseph had been separated from his brothers, these sons of Jacob had changed in character. Envious, turbulent, deceptive, cruel, and revengeful they had been. But now, when tested by adversity, they were shown to be unselfish, true to one another, devoted to their father, and themselves middle-aged men, subject to his authority. The three days in the Egyptian prison were days of bitter sorrow as the brothers reflected upon their past sins. Unless Benjamin could be produced, their conviction as spies appeared certain, 
and they had little hope of gaining their father's consent to Benjamin's absence. On the third day, Joseph caused the brothers to be brought before him. He dared not detain them longer. Already his father and the families with him might be suffering for food. This do and live, he said, for I fear God. If ye be true men, let one of your brethren be bound in the house of your prison. Go ye, carry corn for the famine of your houses, but bring your youngest brother unto me. So shall your words be verified, and ye shall not die. This proposition they agreed to accept, though expressing little hope that their father would let Benjamin return with them. Joseph had communicated with them through an interpreter, and having no thought that the governor understood them, they conversed freely with one another in his presence. They accused themselves in regard to their treatment of Joseph. We are verily guilty concerning our brother, in that we saw the anguish of his soul when he besought us, and we would not hear. Therefore is this distress come upon us. Reuben, who had formed the plan for delivering him at Dothan, added, Spake I not unto you, saying, Do not sin against the child, and ye would not hear? Therefore, behold, also his blood is required. Joseph, listening, could not control his emotions, and he went out and wept. On his return he commanded that Simeon be bound before them, and again committed to prison. In the cruel treatment of their brother, Simeon had been the instigator and chief actor, and it was for this reason that the choice fell upon him. Before permitting his brothers to depart, Joseph gave directions that they should be supplied with grain, and also that each man's money should be secretly placed in the mouth of his sack. Provender for the beasts on the homeward journey was also supplied. On the way, one of the company, opening his sack, was surprised to find his bag of silver. On his making known the fact to the others, they were alarmed and perplexed, and said one to another, What is this that God hath done unto us? Should they regard it as a token of good from the Lord? Or had he suffered it to occur to punish them for their sins, and plunge them still deeper in affliction? They acknowledged that God had seen their sins, and that he was now punishing them. Jacob was anxiously awaiting the return of his sons, and on their arrival the whole encampment gathered eagerly around them as they related to their father all that had occurred. Alarm and apprehension filled every heart. The conduct of the Egyptian governor seemed to imply some evil design, and their fears were confirmed when, as they opened their sacks, the owner's money was found in each. In his distress the aged father exclaimed, me have ye bereaved of my children. Joseph is not, and Simeon is not, and ye will take Benjamin away. All these things are against me. Reuben answered, Slay my two sons, if I bring him not to thee. Deliver him into my hand, and I will bring him to thee again. This rash speech did not relieve the mind of Jacob. His answer was, my son shall not go down with you, for his brother is dead, and he is left alone. If mischief befall him by the way in the which ye go, then shall ye bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to the grave. But the drought continued, and in the process of time the supply of grain that had been brought from Egypt was nearly exhausted. The sons of Jacob well knew that it would be in vain to return to Egypt without Benjamin. They had little hope of changing their father's resolution, and they awaited the issue in silence. Deeper and deeper grew the shadow of approaching famine. In the anxious faces of all in the encampment, the old man read their need. At last he said, Go again, buy us a little food. Judah answered, the man did solemnly protest unto us, saying, Ye shall not see my face, except your brother be with you. If thou wilt send our brother with us, we will go down and buy thee food. But if thou wilt not send him, we will not go down. For the man said unto us, Ye shall not see my face, except your brother be with you. Seeing that his father's resolution began to waver, he added, Send the lad with me 
and we will arise and go, that we may live and not die, both we and thou, and also our little ones. And he offered to be surety for his brother, and to bear the blame forever, if he failed to restore Benjamin to his father. Jacob could no longer withhold his consent, and he directed his sons to prepare for the journey. He bade them also take to the ruler a present of such things as the famine-wasted country afforded, a little balm, and a little honey, spices, and myrrh, nuts, and almonds, also a double quantity of money. Take also your brother, he said, and arise, go again unto the man. As his sons were about to depart on their doubtful journey, the aged father arose, and, raising his hands to heaven, uttered the prayer, God Almighty, give you mercy before the man, that he may send away your other brother and Benjamin. If I be bereaved of my children, I am bereaved. Again they journeyed to Egypt and presented themselves before Joseph. As his eye fell upon Benjamin, his own mother's son, he was deeply moved. He concealed his emotion, however, but ordered that they be taken to his house and that preparation be made for them to dine with him. Upon being conducted to the governor's palace, the brothers were greatly alarmed, fearing that they were to be called to account for the money found in their sacks. They thought that it might have been intentionally placed there to furnish occasion for making them slaves. In their distress they consulted with the steward of the house, relating to him the circumstances of their visit to Egypt, and in proof of their innocence informed him that they had brought back the money found in their sacks, also other money to buy food, and they added, We cannot tell who put our money in our sacks. The man replied, Peace be to you, fear not. Your God and the God of your father hath given you treasure in your sacks. I had your money. Their anxiety was relieved, and when Simeon, who had been released from prison, joined them, they felt that God was indeed gracious unto them. When the governor again met them, they presented their gifts and humbly bowed themselves to him to the earth. Again his dreams came to his mind, and after saluting his guests, he hastened to ask, Is your father well, the old man of whom ye spake? Is he yet alive? Thy servant, our father, is in good health. He is yet alive, was the answer, as they again made obeisance. Then his eye rested upon Benjamin, and he said, Is this your younger brother of whom ye spake unto me? God be gracious unto thee, my son. But, overpowered by feelings of tenderness, he could say no more. He entered into his chamber and wept there. Having recovered his self-possession, he returned, and all proceeded to the feast. By the laws of caste, the Egyptians were forbidden to eat with people of any other nation. The sons of Jacob had therefore a table by themselves, while the governor, on account of his high rank, ate by himself, and the Egyptians also had separate tables. When all were seated, the brothers were surprised to see that they were arranged in exact order according to their ages. Joseph sent messes unto them from before him, but Benjamin's was five times as much as any of theirs. By this token of favor to Benjamin, he hoped to ascertain if the youngest brother was regarded with the envy and hatred that had been manifested toward himself. Still supposing that Joseph did not understand their language, the brothers freely conversed with one another. Thus he had a good opportunity to learn their real feelings. Still he desired to test them further, and before their departure he ordered that his own drinking cup of silver should be concealed in the sack of the youngest. Joyfully they set out on their return. Simeon and Benjamin were with them, their animals were laden with grain, and all felt that they had safely escaped the perils that had seemed to surround them but they had only reached the outskirts of the city when they were overtaken by the governor's steward, who uttered the scathing inquiry, Wherefore have ye rewarded evil for good? Is not this it in which my Lord drinketh, and whereby indeed he divineth? Ye have done evil in so doing. 
This cup was supposed to possess the power of detecting any poisonous substance placed therein. At that day, cups of this kind were highly valued as a safeguard against murder by poisoning. To the steward's accusation, the travelers answered, Wherefore saith my lord these words? God forbid that thy servants should do according to this thing. Behold, the money which we found in our sacks' mouths, we brought again unto thee out of the land of Canaan. How then should we steal out of thy Lord's house silver or gold? With whomsoever thy servants it be found, both let him die, and we also will be my Lord's bondmen. Now also let it be according unto your words, said the steward. He with whom it is found shall be my servant and ye shall be blameless. The search began immediately. They speedily took down every man his sack to the ground, and the steward examined each, beginning with Reuben's, and taking them in order down to that of the youngest. In Benjamin's sack the cup was found. The brothers rent their garments in token of utter wretchedness, and slowly returned to the city. By their own promise, Benjamin was doomed to a life of slavery. They followed the steward to the palace, and finding the governor yet there, they prostrated themselves before him. What deed is this that ye have done? He said. What ye not that such a man as I can certainly divine? Joseph designed to draw from them an acknowledgment of their sin. He had never claimed the power of divination but was willing to have them believe that he could read the secrets of their lives. Judah answered, What shall we say unto my Lord? What shall we speak? Or how shall we clear ourselves? God hath found out the iniquity of thy servants. Behold, we are my Lord's servants, both we and he also with whom the cup is found. God forbid that I should do so, was the reply. But the man in whose hand the cup is found, he shall be my servant. And as for you, get you up in peace unto your father. In his deep distress, Judah now drew near to the ruler and exclaimed, O my Lord, let thy servant, I pray thee, speak a word in my Lord's ears, and let not thine anger burn against thy servant, for thou art even as Pharaoh. In words of touching eloquence, he described his father's grief at the loss of Joseph and his reluctance to let Benjamin come with them to Egypt, as he was the only son left of his mother, Rachel, whom Jacob so dearly loved. Now, therefore, he said, when I come to thy servant, my father, and the lad be not with us, seeing that his life is bound up in the lad's life, it shall come to pass, when he seeth the lad is not with us, that he will die and thy servants shall bring down the gray hairs of thy servant our father with sorrow to the grave. For thy servant became surety for the lad unto my father, saying, If I bring him not unto thee, then I shall bear the blame to my father forever. Now, therefore, I pray thee, let thy servant abide instead of the lad, a bondman to my lord, and let the lad go up with his brethren, for how shall I go up to my father, and the lad be not with me? Lest peradventure I see the evil that shall come on my father. Joseph was satisfied. He had seen in his brothers the fruits of true repentance. Upon hearing Judah's noble offer, he gave orders that all but these men should withdraw. Then, weeping aloud, he cried, I am Joseph. Doth my father yet live? His brothers stood motionless, dumb with fear and amazement. The ruler of Egypt, their brother Joseph, whom they had envied and would have murdered and finally sold as a slave. All their ill treatment of him passed before them. They remembered how they had despised his dreams and had labored to prevent their fulfillment. Yet they had acted their part in fulfilling these dreams. And now, now that they were completely in his power, he would no doubt avenge the wrong that he had suffered. Seeing their confusion, he said kindly, Come near to me, 
I pray you. And as they came near, he continued, I am Joseph, your brother, whom ye sold into Egypt. Now, therefore, be not grieved, nor angry with yourselves, that ye sold me hither. For God did send me before you to preserve life. Feeling that they had already suffered enough for their cruelty toward him, he nobly sought to banish their fears and lessen the bitterness of their self-reproach. For these two years, he continued, hath the famine been in the land, and yet there are five years in the which there shall neither be earing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth, and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not you that sent me hither, but God. And he hath made me a father to Pharaoh, and lord of all his house, and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Haste ye, and go up to my father, and say unto him, Thus saith thy son Joseph, God hath made me lord of all Egypt. Come down unto me, tarry not, and thou shalt dwell in the land of Goshen, and thou shalt be near unto me, thou and thy children, and thy children's children, and thy flocks, and thy herds, and all that thou hast, and there will I nourish thee, for yet there are five years of famine, lest thou and thy household and all that thou hast come to poverty. And behold, your eyes see, and the eyes of my brother Benjamin, that it is my mouth that speaketh unto you. And he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept, and Benjamin wept upon his neck. Moreover he kissed all his brethren, and wept upon them. And after that his brethren talked with him. They humbly confessed their sin, and entreated his forgiveness. They had long suffered anxiety and remorse, and now they rejoiced that he was still alive. The news of what had taken place was quickly carried to the king, who, eager to manifest his gratitude to Joseph, confirmed the governor's invitation to his family, saying, The good of all the land of Egypt is yours. The brothers were sent away abundantly supplied with provision and carriages and everything necessary for the removal of all their families and attendants to Egypt. On Benjamin, Joseph bestowed more valuable gifts than upon the others. Then, fearing that disputes would arise among them on the homeward journey, he gave them, as they were about to leave him, the charge, See that ye fall not out by the way. The sons of Jacob returned to their father with the joyful tidings, Joseph is yet alive, and he is governor over all the land of Egypt. At first the aged man was overwhelmed. He could not believe what he heard. But when he saw the long train of wagons and loaded animals, and when Benjamin was with him once more, he was convinced, and in the fullness of his joy exclaimed, It is enough! Joseph, my son, is yet alive. I will go and see him before I die. Another act of humiliation remained for the ten brothers. They now confessed to their father the deceit and cruelty that for so many years had embittered his life and theirs. Jacob had not suspected them of so base a sin, but he saw that all had been overruled for good, and he forgave and blessed his erring children. The father and his sons, with their families, their flocks and herds, and numerous attendants, were soon on the way to Egypt. With gladness of heart they pursued their journey, and when they came to Beersheba, the patriarch offered grateful sacrifices, and entreated the Lord to grant them an assurance that he would go with them. In a vision of the night the divine word came to him, Fear not to go down into Egypt, for I will there make of thee a great nation. I will go down with thee into Egypt, and I will also surely bring thee up again. The assurance, Fear not to go down into Egypt, for I will there make of thee a great nation, was significant. The promise had been given to Abraham of a posterity numberless as the stars, but as yet the chosen people had increased but slowly. And the land of Canaan now offered no field for the development of such a nation as had been foretold. It was in the possession of powerful heathen tribes that were not to be dispossessed until the fourth generation. 
If the descendants of Israel were here to become a numerous people, they must either drive out the inhabitants of the land or disperse themselves among them. The former, according to the divine arrangement, they could not do. And should they mingle with the Canaanites, they would be in danger of being seduced into idolatry. Egypt, however, offered the conditions necessary to the fulfillment of the divine purpose. A section of country well watered and fertile was opened to them there, affording every advantage for their speedy increase. And the antipathy they must encounter in Egypt on account of their occupation, for every shepherd was an abomination unto the Egyptians, would enable them to remain a distinct and separate people, and would thus serve to shut them out from participation in the idolatry of Egypt. Upon reaching Egypt, the company proceeded directly to the land of Goshen. Thither came Joseph in his chariot of state, attended by a princely retinue. The splendor of his surroundings and the dignity of his position were alike forgotten. One thought alone filled his mind. One longing thrilled his heart. As he beheld the travelers approaching, the love whose yearnings had for so many long years been repressed would no longer be controlled. He sprang from his chariot and hastened forward to bid his father welcome. And he fell on his neck and wept on his neck a good while. And Israel said unto Joseph, Now let me die, since I have seen thy face, because thou art yet alive. Joseph took five of his brothers to present to Pharaoh and receive from him the grant of land for their future home. Gratitude to his prime minister would have led the monarch to honor them with appointments to offices of state. But Joseph, true to the worship of Jehovah, sought to save his brothers from the temptations to which they would be exposed at a heathen court. Therefore he counseled them, when questioned by the king, to tell him frankly their occupation. The sons of Jacob followed this counsel, being careful also to state that they had come to sojourn in the land, not to become permanent dwellers there, thus reserving the right to depart if they chose. The king assigned them a home, as offered, in the best of the land, the country of Goshen. Not long after their arrival, Joseph brought his father also to be presented to the king. The patriarch was a stranger in royal courts, but amid the sublime scenes of nature he had communed with a mightier monarch, and now, in conscious superiority, he raised his hands and blessed Pharaoh. In his first greeting to Joseph, Jacob had spoken as if, with this joyful ending to his long anxiety and sorrow, he was ready to die. But seventeen years were yet to be granted him in the peaceful retirement of Goshen. These years were in happy contrast to those that had preceded them. He saw in his sons evidence of true repentance. He saw his family surrounded by all the conditions needful for the development of a great nation, and his faith grasped the sure promise of their future establishment in Canaan. He himself was surrounded with every token of love and favor that the prime minister of Egypt could bestow, and happy in the society of his long-lost son, he passed down gently and peacefully to the grave. As he felt death approaching, he sent for Joseph. Still holding fast the promise of God respecting the possession of Canaan, he said, Bury me not, I pray thee, in Egypt, but I will lie with my fathers, and thou shalt carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burying place. Joseph promised to do so, but Jacob was not satisfied. He exacted a solemn oath to lay him beside his fathers in the cave of Machpelah. Another important matter demanded attention. The sons of Joseph were to be formally instated among the children of Israel. Joseph, coming for a last interview with his father, brought with him Ephraim and Manasseh. These youths were connected, through their mother, with the highest order of the Egyptian priesthood, and the position of their father opened to them the avenues to wealth and distinction should they choose to connect themselves with the Egyptians. It was Joseph's desire, however, that they should unite with their own people. He manifested his faith in the covenant promise in behalf of his sons renouncing all the honors that the court of Egypt offered for a place among the despised shepherd tribes to whom had been entrusted the oracles of God. Said Jacob, 
thy two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, which were born unto thee in the land of Egypt, before I came unto thee into Egypt, are mine. As Reuben and Simeon, they shall be mine. They were to be adopted as his own, and to become the heads of separate tribes. Thus, one of the birthright privileges which Reuben had forfeited was to fall to Joseph, a double portion in Israel. Jacob's eyes were dim with age, and he had not been aware of the presence of the young men. But now, catching the outline of their forms, he said, Who are these? On being told, he added, Bring them, I pray thee, unto me, and I will bless them. As they came nearer, the patriarch embraced and kissed them, solemnly laying his hands upon their heads in benediction. Then he uttered the prayer, God, before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac did walk, the God which fed me all my life long unto this day, the angel which redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads. There was no spirit of self-dependence, no reliance upon human power or cunning now. God had been his preserver and support. There was no complaint of the evil days in the past. Its trials and sorrows were no longer regarded as things that were against him. Memory recalled only his mercy and loving kindness, who had been with him throughout his pilgrimage. The blessing ended, Jacob gave his son the assurance, leaving for the generations to come, through long years of bondage and sorrow, this testimony to his faith. Behold, I die, but God shall be with you and bring you again unto the land of your fathers. At the last all the sons of Jacob were gathered about his dying bed. And Jacob called unto his sons, and said, Gather yourselves together, and hear, ye sons of Jacob, and hearken unto Israel your father, that I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. Often and anxiously he had thought of their future, and had endeavored to picture to himself the history of the different tribes. Now, as his children waited to receive his last blessing, the spirit of inspiration rested upon him, and before him in prophetic vision the future of his descendants was unfolded. One after another the names of his sons were mentioned, the character of each was described, and the future history of the tribe was briefly foretold. Reuben, Thou art my firstborn, my might, and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity, and the excellency of power. Thus the father pictured what should have been the position of Reuben as the firstborn son. But his grievous sin at Edar had made him unworthy of the birthright blessing. Jacob continued, Unstable as water, thou shalt not excel. The priesthood was appointed to Levi, the kingdom and the messianic promise to Judah, and the double portion of the inheritance to Joseph. The tribe of Reuben never rose to any eminence in Israel. It was not so numerous as Judah, Joseph, or Dan, and was among the first that were carried into captivity. Next in age to Reuben were Simeon and Levi. They had been united in their cruelty toward the Shechemites, and they had also been the most guilty in the selling of Joseph. Concerning them it was declared, I will divide them in Jacob, and scatter them in Israel. At the numbering of Israel, just before their entrance to Canaan, Simeon was the smallest tribe. Moses, in his last blessing, made no reference to Simeon. In the settlement of Canaan, this tribe had only a small portion of Judah's lot, and such families as afterward became powerful formed different colonies and settled in territory outside the borders of the Holy Land. Levi also received no inheritance except 48 cities scattered in different parts of the land. In the case of this tribe, however, their fidelity to Jehovah when the other tribes apostatized secured their appointment to the sacred service of the sanctuary, and thus the curse was changed into a blessing. The crowning blessings of the birthright were transferred to Judah. The significance of the name, which denotes praise, is unfolded in the prophetic history of this tribe. 
Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down, he couched as a lion, and as an old lion. Who shall rouse him up? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. The lion, king of the forest, is a fitting symbol of this tribe, from which came David and the son of David, Shiloh, the true lion of the tribe of Judah, to whom all powers shall finally bow and all nations render homage. For most of his children, Jacob foretold a prosperous future. At last the name of Joseph was reached, and the father's heart overflowed as he invoked blessings upon the head of him that was separate from his brethren. Joseph is a fruitful bough, even a fruitful bough by a well, whose branches run over the wall. The archers have sorely grieved him, and shot at him, and hated him, but his bow abode in strength, and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. From thence is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. Even by the God of thy father, who shall help thee, and by the Almighty, who shall bless thee with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that lieth under, blessings of the breasts and of the womb. The blessings of thy father have prevailed above the blessings of my progenitors unto the utmost bound of the everlasting hills. They shall be on the head of Joseph, and on the crown of the head of him that was separate from his brethren. Jacob had ever been a man of deep and ardent affection. His love for his sons was strong and tender, and his dying testimony to them was not the utterance of partiality or resentment. He had forgiven them all, and he loved them to the last. His paternal tenderness would have found expression only in words of encouragement and hope, but the power of God rested upon him, and under the influence of inspiration he was constrained to declare the truth, however painful. The last blessings pronounced, Jacob repeated the charge concerning his burial place. I am to be gathered unto my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Machpelah. There they buried Abraham and Sarah his wife, there they buried Isaac and Rebekah his wife, and there I buried Leah. Thus the last act of his life was to manifest his faith in God's promise. Jacob's last years brought an evening of tranquility and repose after a troubled and weary day. Clouds had gathered dark above his path, yet his sun set clear, and the radiance of heaven illumined his parting hours. Says the scripture, at evening time it shall be light. Zechariah chapter 14, verse 7. Mark the perfect man, and behold the upright, for the end of that man is peace. Psalm 37, verse 37. Jacob had sinned, and had deeply suffered. Many years of toil, care, and sorrow had been his since the day when his great sin caused him to flee from his father's tents. A homeless fugitive, separated from his mother, whom he never saw again. Laboring seven years for her whom he loved, only to be basely cheated. Toiling twenty years in the service of a covetous and grasping kinsman. Seeing his wealth increasing and sons rising around him, but finding little joy in the contentious and divided household. Distressed by his daughter's shame and by her brother's revenge, by the death of Rachel, by the unnatural crime of Reuben, by Judah's sin, by the cruel deception and malice practiced toward Joseph. How long and dark is the catalogue of evil spread out to view. Again and again he had reaped the fruit of that first wrong deed. Over and over he saw repeated among his sons the sins of which he himself had been guilty. 
But bitter as had been the discipline, it had accomplished its work. The chastening, though grievous, had yielded the peaceable fruit of righteousness. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11. Inspiration faithfully records the faults of good men, those who were distinguished by the favor of God. Indeed, their faults are more fully presented than their virtues. This has been a subject of wonder to many, and has given the infidel occasion to scoff at the Bible. But it is one of the strongest evidences of the truth of Scripture, that facts are not glossed over, nor the sins of its chief characters suppressed. The minds of men are so subject to prejudice that it is not possible for human histories to be absolutely impartial. Had the Bible been written by uninspired persons, it would no doubt have presented the character of its honored men in more flattering light. But as it is, we have a correct record of their experiences. Men whom God favored and to whom he entrusted great responsibilities were sometimes overcome by temptation and committed sin, even as we at the present day strive, waver, and frequently fall into error. Their lives, with all their faults and follies, are open before us, both for our encouragement and warning. If they had been represented as without fault, we, with our sinful nature, might despair at our own mistakes and failures. But seeing where others struggled through discouragements like our own, where they fell under temptation as we have done, and yet took heart again and conquered through the grace of God, we are encouraged in our striving after righteousness. As they, though sometimes beaten back, recovered their ground and were blessed of God, so we too may be overcomers in the strength of Jesus. On the other hand, the record of their lives may serve as a warning to us. It shows that God will by no means clear the guilty. He sees sin in his most favored ones, and he deals with it in them even more strictly than in those who have less light and responsibility. After the burial of Jacob, fear again filled the hearts of Joseph's brothers. Notwithstanding his kindness toward them, conscious guilt made them distrustful and suspicious. It might be that he had but delayed his revenge, out of regard to their father, and that he would now visit upon them the long-deferred punishment for their crime. They dared not appear before him in person, but sent a message. Thy father did command before he died, saying, So shall ye say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren and their sin. For they did unto thee evil, and now we pray thee, Forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of thy father. This message affected Joseph to tears, and, encouraged by this, his brothers came and fell down before him with the words, Behold, we be thy servants. Joseph's love for his brothers was deep and unselfish, and he was pained at the thought that they could regard him as cherishing a spirit of revenge toward them. Fear not, he said, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive. Now therefore fear ye not. I will nourish you and your little ones. The life of Joseph illustrates the life of Christ. It was envy that moved the brothers of Joseph to sell him as a slave, they hoped to prevent him from becoming greater than themselves. And when he was carried to Egypt, they flattered themselves that they were to be no more troubled with his dreams, that they had removed all possibility of their fulfillment. But their own course was overruled by God to bring about the very event that they designed to hinder. So the Jewish priests and elders were jealous of Christ, fearing that he would attract the attention of the people from them. They put him to death to prevent him from becoming king, but they were thus bringing about this very result. Joseph, through his bondage in Egypt, became a savior to his father's family. Yet this fact did not lessen the guilt of his brothers. So the crucifixion of Christ by his enemies made him the redeemer of mankind, the savior of the fallen race, 
and ruler over the whole world. But the crime of his murderers was just as heinous as though God's providential hand had not controlled events for his own glory and the good of man. As Joseph was sold to the heathen by his own brothers, so Christ was sold to his bitterest enemies by one of his disciples. Joseph was falsely accused and thrust into prison because of his virtue. So Christ was despised and rejected because his righteous self-denying life was a rebuke to sin, and though guilty of no wrong, he was condemned upon the testimony of false witnesses. And Joseph's patience and meekness under injustice and oppression, his ready forgiveness and noble benevolence toward his unnatural brothers, represent the Savior's uncomplaining endurance of the malice and abuse of wicked men, and his forgiveness, not only of his murderers, but of all who have come to him confessing their sins and seeking pardon. Joseph outlived his father fifty-four years. He lived to see Ephraim's children of the third generation. The children also of Machir, the son of Manasseh, were brought up upon Joseph's knees. He witnessed the increase and prosperity of his people, and through all the years his faith in God's restoration of Israel to the land of promise was unshaken. When he saw that his end was near, he summoned his kinsmen about him. Honored as he had been in the land of Pharaohs, Egypt was to him but the place of his exile. His last act was to signify that his lot was cast with Israel. His last words were, God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land unto the land which he sware to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And he took a solemn oath of the children of Israel that they would carry up his bones with them to the land of Canaan. So Joseph died, being an hundred and ten years old, and they embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. And through the centuries of toil which followed, that coffin, a reminder of the dying words of Joseph, testified to Israel that they were only sojourners in Egypt, and bade them keep their hopes fixed upon the land of promise, for the time of deliverance would surely come.